Hi, my name is Joe Maycook, <laughs> and I am here with the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society um, for the Community Gardens Memory Project. And today is March 16th, 2022, uh, and I'm here in the 100 North 20th Street <laughs> office building of the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society, PHS, with Sally McCabe, longtime community gardener, longtime PHS worker, and as you will talk about today, someone who's been involved with community gardening in Philadelphia very deeply for the past five or so decades. Um, <laughs> maybe a little bit, give or take. A, give or take. Yeah, give or take. Yeah. Um, so Sally, I know I've talked to you a little bit about this, but uh, already um, in a different interview. But for the sake of um, this one, uh, and for the sake of one question, provide a little bit of context, your background. Um, where did you grow up, and did you or your neighbors have gardens there? I grew up in Phoenixville, out in Chester County. Mm -hmm. um, it's a small steel town, and we had a garden, an, erst, uh, an erstwhile garden. Um, because although my grandparents had gardened, my parents were not, um, they were not knowledgeable in, in <laughs> gardening. And so we sometimes had a garden and sometimes we didn't. My dad was um, really, really loved kohlrabi and you couldn't buy it in the store. So we had a garden where you grew kohlrabi. And I learned to garden my grandmother, my mother's mother, who also lived in Phoenixville. Um, had a flower garden and she swore by chicken manure and whatever Jack Eden said. Jack Eden was the KYW gardener um, for, for many years and um, if he said yeah take match heads and stick them in the hole with the tomatoes she would take match heads and stick them in the hole with the tomatoes. Um, that was just that was nanny. Um, she was more of a flower gardener, but my, um, my uncle was also a flower gardener and he bred iris and daylilies. He would pollinate them by hand and, and start new varieties. He really liked, uh, striped leaves. So, um, at some point in time, my mom got a bunch of plants from him and started a flower garden and then a vegetable garden. And I got involved when I was, mm, I guess, maybe seven or eight, because I had the choice between um, I could do the dishes or I could pull the weeds in the garden. And mm, uh, yeah, so you know where I went. And then I, um, I really liked gardening and I really liked weeds and flower, wildflowers. Um, and so, I thought that I wanted to be a veterinarian. And so uh, when I went to, when it was time to go to college, I went to Penn State and I started out in veterinary medicine and it was not my thing um, for a lot of different reasons. And, um, but horticulture was always there in the background. And my friend who lived down the hall had these n amazing coleus houseplants and I said Nancy how did you do that and she said well I snipped it here and snipped it there and I added a little of this and that and um, I was hooked so I started going to classes with her and ended up changing my major um, probably five times over the course of two years but it, my second choice was always horticulture and um, so finally I thought it was realized it was ridiculous that I was doing all these other things if horticulture was always there then I was going to be a gardener or a farmer of some sort. So I finished um, a degree in Penn State in vegetable, um, vegetable emphasis, alericulture. And um, at that point in time, you had, it was the 70s. So I got out of college in 76. And at that point in time, if you wanted to farm, you had to, and you were a woman, you had to be born on a farm or you had to marry a farmer, or you had to move to Israel and work on a kibbutz, or you had to join the Peace Corps, or last ditch, you worked for the Extension Service, 
which was Penn State's um, outreach program. And a job came up in Philadelphia um, working for Libby Goldstein. And I came down and I interviewed and they said, well, she's nice and she's cute and she knows gardening, but the city will eat her alive and they didn't hire me. And um, about six months later, they had still not filled all the positions and somebody said, well, what about that little girl out in the suburbs? And she said, well, all right, we'll try her. And that was 77 and um, I've been at it ever since. So I'm going to let you get a question, a word in edgewise because I had coffee. Yeah, okay. Um, so I understand. So yeah, thank you. Um, that really puts the extension in context a lot. And I do want to ask more about the extension specifically in a second because um, I want to talk through the links between the extension um, and other community garden programs in the city. But I want to st I want to get us there by also talking about specific community gardens because that's the you know one of the great focuses of the project and also I think um, I'd like to hear more about you know gardens in uh, in a you know in an anecdotal lens. So you talked a bit about um, the uh, about CD Acres about its development. 1983. I understand you also have stories to tell about what is now Julian Abel Park, but what was at the time called Garden of Adam and Eve, God Bless America. <laughs> um, if I'm getting that right. Yeah, yeah, that was, um, that was an amazing garden. Um, I started working for Penn State, and Penn State, the way Penn State did their outreach was to divide the city into geographic areas and start a demonstration garden in each um, so that each of the staff person had a garden where what that was their home base and in fact a lot of these gardens are now preserved through the neighborhood gardens association uh, neighborhood gardens trust um, and this garden was at the corner of 22nd and Montrose in South Philly and it was it had been it had been housing, it had been houses, and the houses went into disrepair, and they tore three of them down that faced 22nd Street. And there used to be a group of guys who hung out at Billy Brown's Grocery, was a variety store, right on the corner, on the southwest corner. The lots were in the southeast corner. And they would sit there and they would drink something in brown bags whatever you drank in brown bags in the 70s was their thing. And they were all, let's just say, retired, um, although some of them were not that old. Um, and they said, well, that's ridiculous. Somebody should clean that lot up. And um, somehow Penn State got word that these guys wanted to start a garden and got them soil and some fencing. and that point in time the city um, dealt with vacant lots by putting up what they called rat control posts which were um, wooden bollards and they were um, they were like uh, eight feet apart so that the idea was they would just po put posts around um, around a lot and then you couldn't back a truck up and dump so they were sort of a dump prevention and the guys started this garden and they were from the south um, mostly north and south carolina uh, one guy from georgia and they did they put this beautiful uh, vegetable garden together and they would they started calling it the garden of eden um but and it was all men um and then miss young um who lived up in the 2100 block um joined the garden and because Miss Young was in it it had to be the Garden of Adam and Eve because they had to include her so they called it the Garden of Adam and Eve and they would decorate the garden whenever somebody got the mood um, one day you would go by and the posts would all be red and another day you would go by and all the posts and the fence the wire fencing would be painted and then there would be a new gate and the gate would be painted and 
one holiday they did the all the posts in red white and blue and they liked it so much they just did a red a white a blue a red a white a blue all the way around the lot and um somebody said it's it's the God Bless America Garden, they, they referred to it. Um, and so it became the Garden of Adam and Eve, God Bless America. And we referred to it like that until forever. And so your relationship with this garden in the extension was... A, it, yeah, a it kind of was my office. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of I lived there. Um, it was... Um, I was 21... And I knew everything. And here were these guys who were there from the South. Um, and they were very amused by me. Um, and so we would, we would have discussions about, um, okay, um, let's plant corn. Why would we want to plant corn? Everybody's plot is really small. Corn is wind pollinated and you're not gonna get much corn. Um, cause even I knew that with my limited, uh, 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 with my college education and it was finally, it was somebody just, okay. The coordinator's name was, um, Joseph Thomas Porter. He went by Porter. Porter, um, just patted me on the head one day and he said, little white girl from the suburbs. He said, the reason that you have to plant corn in the garden is because then it looks like a farm. Also then you don't have to go home to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and I said, okay, I can be taught. <laughs> I can learn these things. So I planted corn as well. <laughs> Only I planted corn. And that was when um, sweet corn was just being developed. It was a new thing. I mean, you could get sweet corn, but sweet corn, you had to pick it and eat it the same day because it went right to starch. So they were doing the development um, and they had been doing, I had worked on it at Penn State, they were doing the breeding of sweet, sweet, or sweet, or sweet corn. And they had this brand new variety that was called Silver King. And Silver King was 10 feet tall. So I got a hold of some Silver King seeds. And uh, I said these guys are from the South. And they, um, they were very much southern gardeners, which meant you used no mulch, you added no, you just added fertilizer, and you made your rows three feet apart, and you went out with a hoe every day, and you hoed down the weeds. So bare soil, um, saved seeds, corn was, you know, four and five feet tall. Well, I was trying to get them for years to mulch, always. You know, let's add some uh, compost to this. Let's. So I planted my uh, Silver King corn, which ultimately grows to 10 feet tall, mm -hmm. and mulched the heck out of it. And um, all of a sudden, I had 10 foot corn, and they had four foot corn. And they conceded that maybe mulch would make a difference and maybe I knew something. So from then on, I had no trouble getting them to add compost to the soil. And, uh, and that became my um, first, first contribution <laughs> to the <laughs> Garden of Adam and Eve, God Bless America, you know, uh, where they weren't making fun of me. These guys were the most amazing storytellers. And they would tell, they would sit and spin yarns from one end of the day to the other with their little brown bags um, with I'm guessing probably most times it was soda, but they didn't want to uh, share that it was soda. It was, it was they were, um, they were a lot of fun. But um, they were always a good place to take visiting dignitaries because they were always welcoming. They always had a beautiful garden. They had um, trash picked chairs in an arena. So they had a nice place to hang out. And so whenever you were touring someone around the city, you knew that you would be welcome there and that they would entertain. And one day I had um, a group of, we were, it was a group of garden club ladies um, and we, it was one of the clubs that we affectionately referred to as the Blue Hairs. It was a bunch of older women with 
um, who didn't know the city and were a little afraid of the city. Um, so I took them there and plopped them down. And the guys proceeded to tell them their complaints about the snake issue. They, um, they said snakes are a terrible issue in the city. Um, and we've got a problem with them right now because um, there was a fire down the street. And I'm thinking, okay, a fire in the city, snakes, what? He said, well, you know about the shark snakes, don't you? I thought, shark snakes, this is not something that they teach you at Penn State. Um, I said, well, no, I don't. And he said, well, you know the regular hydrants. Sometimes there's not enough pressure in the hydrants. So every couple of blocks you see the really stubby bright red hydrants. And, uh, and they said, those are direct from the river. And it's like, I knew that much. And they said, well, when they can't get enough pressure out of the regular hydrants, they find the, the ones that pump water straight up from the river. And of course, all the river life comes with them. And shark snakes, um, they're a snake that can, is small enough to go through the pipes. But um, once it gets out of the pipe, it can puff itself up and turn into a shark. And we think there's one, there's, um, there's some living in the basement of that house, and um, we're afraid they're going to eat the children. <laughs> and they said, in fact, actually, we found a small one, and we put it in, we put it in the shed so, because people were starting to steal stuff. So we put a shark snake in the, in the shed, and we feed it, we feed it cats, and um, no one has bothered to shed since then. Um, but um, that they did find, uh, finally, they, they were talking about the hoop snakes. The hoop snakes are snakes that um, they put their tail in their mouths and they roll. And they had all, Warren had, who's another gardener, Warren had left the gate open and all of the hoop snakes had escaped. But fortunately, old man Hudson, who lived down the street, Mr. Hudson, um, caught them and put them on his granddaughter's bicycle for tires. <laughs> this is not, I know, I just, this is the joy of, of sharing, um, sharing gardens with people and being able to actually spend time in these gardens and, um, and to share, to share the stories that often have nothing to do with gardening. But um, like I said, you always could bet um, you would always be entertained um, when you went to this garden. I have a very detail-oriented question, um, but we're so we've talked a lot about, you know, well, you get you've given a great story about the story of these snakes. Uh, <laughs> how big of a well? I mean, how common would you say snakes were in? The garden that day. Well, we had um, the, the snakes. There are snakes in the city. They're generally little garter snakes or little DK snakes, little brown snakes. Um, nobody, to my knowledge, has found any uh, venomous snakes. But um, mm -hmm. we did have um, have a garden next to uh, a house that was built. It was a log cabin, and they had brought the logs up from um, from West Virginia. A guy had some property in West Virginia, and uh, he brought up a truckload of logs and started to build a log cabin, um, which still is still um, not. This is in Northern Liberties, not in South. And the neighbors complain that since then there's been a proliferation of snakes and uh, um, swearing that they're copperheads and they're that I've never seen a copperhead in the city. So, um, oh, you know, no, to hear people say it was rattlesnakes. There are rattlesnakes in the, and, and they're big, as big as this table. And, but, you know, it's stories. You have to tell mm -hmm. stories. Oh, yeah, no. I, I was, stories go with all of it. I was curious, like, because I've had an interview with Bob Jobin at Bouvier Community Garden, um, so 15th at Bouvier, right, right. And he talked about, I don't remember what specific species of snake it was, but encountering one of those there that like a herpetologist um, was impressed with. And that was in the past like decade. Oh, so. impressing so. herpetologists has always been my goal. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm glad about? that Joe could do, uh, uh, that uh, 
Bob. Bob could do that. Yeah, you're Joe. <laughs> it's like Joe, you could do that too. We got the same sounds in our names. So yeah, um, snakes in in the garden are um, are fairly common, even in the most ur- urban of settings. Um, not big snakes, little little guys, um, and they eat bugs, and they eat the the slightly larger ones. Will eat. Will keep the uh, um, mouse population down. Mouse it, mice and moles and voles. Um, we don't usually get the snakes. Don't usually get big enough to eat rats. Certainly not big enough to eat um, cats and small children. So that's not something I lose sleep over at night. Do you remember how the um, the blue hair congregation reacted to this story? They acted like it was something that happened to them every day. <laughs> they were they were very gracious, and they invited themselves back the year after and the year after when they were uh, whenever they were in town judging for a city gardens contest. And this garden um, was always a winner in, citywide. Um, was that something you got to lord over the other oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. extensions? Well, there were, um, well, actually, we all worked really hard to make sure that the, the demo gardens got um, ranked high in the, mm-hmm. and, um, and in fact, there was always a, 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 there was a friendly and then some not, sometimes not so friendly rivalry. Uh, between um, there was um, 1500 Grace Ferry which is a garden that's trying to get revived right now the one right on the bridge um, um, Southwark Queen Village and then 56th and Haverford which is now I think a sh- supermarket it's a huge garden and they were the larger gardens so they were in the large garden category and they were always you know it was like one year this garden would win oh and Aspen Farms 49th and Aspen um so there was always um, a, a, a rivalry of who's going to win it this year. And finally, they uh, made them all retire for a year so that somebody else could come up through the ranks and win. Wait, sorry. Re- repeat that. 1500 Grays Ferry, 56 in Haverford, Aspen Farms. What was the... F- Aspen Farms wasn't actually... wasn't um, That was not a, a an urban gardening... Uh, a, a Penn State garden. Um, so... But it was one of the larger gardens, so it was always competing in the city gardens contest with Southwark Queen Village. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I was thinking, fifty six is fifty six in Haverford the one that um, Doris Stahl was working with? It might have been. She may I, have. She may have yeah. worked with them. I remember West Philly is where her this quadrant was. Yeah, she was. Um, she started out at the uh, Belmont. Treat, water treatment right. plant that was her that was her first garden and mm-hmm. um, I think by the time Doris came on Doris didn't come on until maybe 80 to Penn State until maybe 86 87 yeah, I think 86 is right and yeah. um, by then uh, 56 and Haverford may have been gone mm-hmm. and where were you by 86 I was um I for the eight years that I was with Penn State, I was at the Pennsylvania State University Cooperative Extension Service Urban Gardening Program. And we had to say that every time we answered the damn phone. Um, so anyway, I was there until the federal funding started in um, in 76. I came on in July of 77. Mm-hmm. And I was there until June of um, 85. And then June of 85, I moved over to the Horse Society's uh, Philadelphia Green Program. So by, that was 85. And then 86, it was, you know, I changed jobs. They gave me a car to drive. They doubled my salary. They gave me an actual office. I shared it, but I had an actual office. And then I got to go back and work with the same people that I had been working with for the last eight years. It was a wonderful, and we're picking, it was a wonderful transition. And picking up the phone, you no longer had to say. And yeah, and I didn't. And um, and then I also had an assistant. I was like, whoa! And they paid me eleven grand. It was the most wonderful thing. I mean, I was rolling in dough at that point. Yeah. Um, but so let's let's back up a little bit because now you have mentioned another program I want to talk about, Philadelphia Green. Um, so how did you? And we've talked a little bit before about this, but I haven't really 
um, got him to talk to you specifically about Philadelphia Green. And I think, yeah, so just talk to me a bit about, you know, you said that you were working with a lot of the same people as before. How did that program relate to the work you were doing with the Agricultural um, Extension? The Horticultural Society, um, under the guidance of Ernesta Ballard, um, mm-hmm. decided that they needed, they were a wealthy nonprofit, mm-hmm. and they needed to give back to the community. Um, they were famous for the flower show, and um, and they were a membership or a small membership organization. Um, and they um, started the Philadelphia Green program in 75. And what it was, it was a three, three prong program. They did um, container gardening projects. They did um, vegetable gardens and sitting gardens. And they did, at that point, I don't believe they did, they may have done street trees. Um, I'm not sure when the street trees happened, whether that was a year later or two years later, but irrelevant to the big picture. Um, So they were the, the overall greening organization. What they were trying to do was to revive a program called the Neighborhood Gardens Association that had existed in the... 50s, um, which was a, a joint program between suburban garden clubs and um, inner city garden clubs that formed in um, less well to do neighborhoods. Um, because the idea was um, to use gardening as a hook to, to organize neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. So um, it was a kind of weird matriarchal um, it was a bunch of white ladies coming in to the city to um, to show the um, the folks in the inner city neighborhoods how to garden when the folks in the inner city neighborhoods already knew how to garden so it was kind of you know it's like it was a, a really um, it was <sighs> Wonderful things came of it. Um, some beautiful projects came of it. Louise Bush Brown um, uh, was was the driving force here. So anyway, what they um, what was also going on in the inner cities at that point in time was Penn State was making inroads um, through 4-H. So there were 4-H clubs forming. Um, so those were doing more vegetable gardening. So, um, because 4-H was a Penn State thing, Mm -hmm. um, Penn State got federal funding in 76. Um, Six cities got federal funding um, through Jimmy Carter's um, uh, anti-poverty word. Initiative. (laughs) Initiative, thank you. Um, So, they... um, they were able to get funding through the land grant universities at six cities. It's like you know Philadelphia, Chicago, um, L.A., New York. Mm-hmm. I could list you the six, but pulling it out of my ear. Um, and then um, so, but the only thing that they were able to do was education. So the only way we could this is the program that I worked with, the urban gardening program, Uh, we could free up um, money was to start these demonstration gardens. So we started eight demonstration gardens around the city and set them up as little education centers. So we would do workshops there um, and um, strictly around food gardening. So here was the Horticultural Society, big, big program doing greening and beautification and some vegetable gardening and, um, and trees and um, and cl- and then they had um, a classroom project for schools, and then mm-hmm. later a, a program called Green the School Grounds. So when Penn State formed, Penn State took over the the pieces of okay, Philadelphia Green, you start the gardens, and we will do the education necessary to get people growing food and then we would keep track of it, and we would um, figure out how much people were growing and how would we. Um, get the experts from Penn State down into the city to get people growing 
their own food as part of this anti-poverty initiative um, because hunger was an issue then. So hunger, hunger is, the hungry will always be with us. Um, so Penn State had the, the six cities and then the eight cities and then the 16 cities and then the 21 cities. They kept expanding the program and then they killed it because it was an unbelievably successful um, program, but it wasn't, um, it doesn't, wasn't doing the, what the politicians wanted to do. And um, so the funding went away in 90, 91. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a tough time. So we had, at the same time, a national group forming called the American Community Guarding Association. Yeah, talk to me about it. Um, so it was originally the six cities and the eight cities and the 12, 16, and 21. It was formed by the Extension Services and Philadelphia Green. Um, the Hort Society said, well, if you need a place to, we'll be the national headquarters. We will file all the nonprofit, um, the, we would do all the paperwork and all the paperwork could live in Philadelphia because we've got the, um, it, it suits our mission. And um, so that formed in, I would say, 77, 76, 77. Um, so that people wouldn't have to reinvent the wheel. So as each new city came on, there would be mentors. There would be um, this national group. And then we had a, um, a, a conference every year. Um, so we had Penn State from um, 77 to 91. They continued to work with community gardens, but they didn't have this designated federal funding. Mm -hmm. um, and then we had Philadelphia Green doing all of the big stuff, and then we had ACGA doing all of the stuff nationally. Yeah, what was your relationship like to ACGA? Um, oh, we, uh, I mean, the Penn State, uh, Libby was on the board, I was on the board, Blaine from PHS was on the board. When did you join the board? I joined the board, um, I went to my first conference in 1980, and mm -hmm. um, by 81 I had joined the board. Um, Libby was on the board from the very beginning. Blaine was a founding member, so Libby Goldstein was the, um, was a, a founding member. Blaine and um, Delaware Center for Horticulture. Um, so it was like kind of a an East Coast thing that then. Um, but actually, the first conference was in Denver. Denver um, okay. did the first conference. That feels a little bit better than for. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was. I mean. <laughs> Blaine and Libby were extremely forceful people. Um, and so they were the ones that really made it happen to start. Um, and then, um, I won't say that they, they were the only ones that started it because it was Michigan, I mean, uh, Detroit had a, had a program, mm -hmm. LA had a program. And again, everybody wanted to not have to reinvent the wheel. But it was a project of the extensions in it and P and PG. Well, it started out because of this federal funding. Mm -hmm. um, but suddenly there, uh, it, it was like people in, in small towns and large cities um, all caught on that it was a really good way to organize um, people and get them growing food. Mm -hmm. um, and feeding themselves, so it was like a way cool. Um, and there was a lot of um, a lot of good interworking. Um, often on ACGA's national office was here. Um, I would move around as a new person became president, and then it lodged here for I don't know maybe um, five six years in the in the nineties. Um, mm -hmm. Janet Carter and I ran the ran the office. Um, she was on staff here on a gardener yeah. in Francisville um, and we were both on the board mm -hmm. so we were able to then do um, um, uh, we were able to do mentoring um, mm -hmm. so we could get to go to another city and and walk them through the process of um, how we did things and then in n n the 90s garden tenders became a model that we trotted around to different cities mm -hmm. Um, so, 
Okay, talk. You've talked me through, you know, PG, ACGA, and of course the ag extension. I guess now I want to go back to that transition from the ag extension to PG, right? Um, and you talked about the different responsibilities. I guess I'm wondering what actually cha what changed apart from all the nice new benefits that you got in terms of your what changed was job security because um mm -hmm. because the the urban gardening program was a line item in mm -hmm. congress's budget it was very easy to to eliminate it every year when they were trying to do budget cuts and um so you would live with your you know your heart in your throat um and several times we actually had pink slips in our hands because we were going to, you know, there was an end in sight and we were going to get laid off. And um, and and so um, I think it was more, um, it was the opportunity to do more community organizing that wasn't necessarily around food gardening mm -hmm. um, because... Um, we had we were very our hands were very tied with Penn State of we could do um, education and we could do education and that was it mm -hmm. and so to actually get the find the money to do um, to do more projects mm -hmm. was was difficult and um, so eventually. Um, through Libby's driving, she was driven. This woman was driven. Um, she managed to set up food and agriculture, the FAT force, food and agriculture task force. Um, I think there were several FF forces. Um, mm -hmm. and I, I, I would have to check to make sure I got the name right on it. Um, as a nonprofit sister to the urban gardening program that could get funding that didn't then have to get 40 percent of it to go straight to penn state for overhead mm -hmm. um which is the way things work with universities so um she was able to um there was also food and energy systems mm -hmm. um, so that she was able to get the money so that we were able to work on things like um we had fish farms um growing tilapia when no one would eat tilapia now tilapia is you know a mainstay uh -uh. um so we had fish farms um we had um we were working with farmers starting farmers markets we were doing all these little projects that we could get a little bit of money for but um to come over to um to the hort society meant um i could look forward to like if i wanted to stay in this job for 20 years i could mm -hmm. Yeah, and of course, there's then the fact that like did they let me drive a car? They gave me a car. Yeah, they gave. Well, gave I did. I had to share the car with five other people, but it wasn't my own, <laughs> my own car. Eleven eleven thousand a year, a car, uh, and an office with a an carpet office, in it. With a carpet, with an assistant, all mm -hmm. these things. Mm -hmm. um, but so, um, I guess I'm curious now. Obviously, Philadelphia Green hasn't been in operation for some time, and as you noted, the ag extension. Um, well, the, the, the Carter anti-poverty initiative funding going toward, um, the ag extension, everything, uh, disappeared in 1991. Um, so now the, um, the extension in Philadelphia is a lot more limited in scope in some ways. It ebbs and flows. I mean, yeah. sometimes it's, um, sometimes there's, um, there's a lot of, um, a lot of funding for specific for specific mm -hmm. programs. Uh, I mean, they do wonderful things with, they've got the Master Gardening Program. Um, they have um, a program that was for years was called the FNEP, Expanded Food and Nutrition F Food Counseling. Um, they've worked with uh, farmers markets, um, with 4-H. Um, mm -hmm. They're still doing, Penn State is still doing uh, a, yeah. a, a lot, but not as much as I would like to see. You know, I recently had an interview with someone who works with, who at Penn State, and I'm hoping I can get it up soon. Um, but so, I def yeah, I see, I see the the 4-H impact is everywhere, mm -hmm. um, and nice. But I guess what I was really driving at um, with this line of inquiry is I wanted to um, 
ask you a little bit more about the work you currently do um, and how that's changed since you know you came to the position in 1985. Um, um, 85, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. The I've always done community education, mm -hmm. and that has taken a lot of different um, directions. Um, I I mean I did I did community education when I was at Penn State, um, and then when I um, I came to to PHS, um, Philadelphia Green the name went away. The programming still exists. Mm -hmm. So it's just, um, it's blended now much more into, um, um, into the larger PHS picture. And I pretty much where we refer to as healthy neighborhoods. So um, that sort of is the same thing that Philadelphia Green was before. Mm -hmm. um, we suddenly in the mid 80s, um, funding from William Penn, and from Pew Charitable Trusts mm -hmm. was flowing because we were, um, we were what was happening in the city. Um, uh, food issues and greening and beautification became major driving forces within the city. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, it's, first it was Pew and um, said, we want to give you $3 million over the next three years to really beef up this program so um we started the green city teacher no the green uh green country town program which was major emphasis on a neighborhood for three years um and i i mean we could talk more about that but the green country town program started and all of the people that were the hole diggers that would be me, one of them, suddenly were in charge of a full staff of hole diggers. And we were, some of us did really well as managers and others of us did not do well as managers. And so over time, um, to take in all of the people that had been teaching before and suddenly were managers, flawed managers let's just say they formed an educa an actual under the pew money and then supported by william penn formed an education department and the education department which was the library and then the um we did the garden tenders tree tenders green city teachers ag in the uh, uh ag in the classroom um we did a lot of those um those programs as a department rather than as a person, you know, who did teaching within the development, uh, you know, within the department that did developing. And then that went on for 20 years. We had an education department for 20 years. And then when the two presidents ago came in, he said, what's this education? When was this? This was when Drew came in. Okay. So I can look up the date yeah. later. Okay, yeah. cool. I'll do that. Um, yeah, said... Uh, and did away with it. what? What do they do? All everybody should be educators. Um, so it did away with um, the education department, and then we all came in. We got sucked into the other departments. So since I did gardening education, I got pulled into the gardening department. Um, so that set itself up <laughs> for some really interesting. We'll just say interesting um, times because um, I came into the department. And my boss, Claire, um, Claire Baker, at the time said, Sally, I have no idea what you do, what your job is, but you seem to do it well, so keep doing it, and if I can help you in any way, let me know. And it was probably the most wonderful thing that ever happened to me, that Claire gave me that, um, so that I could really expand the Garden Tenders program, I could really um, expand the Green City Teachers program. The idea was that eventually there would be an education department again, and we would again be able to um, support each other as educators. That was the tough part, of uh, because um, the folks who do tree tenders, Mindy, um, does tree tenders and now it's expanded to to include but she was the she was the um, founder and driving force of that um, the needs of educators are, are way different 
the mm -hmm. needs of the departments that are doing the actual physical development. Um, and educators need to be supported as educators. So putting you in your own, in, in a department and saying, okay, you're gonna do it all, it comes a lot of conflict because um, the folks who are developing the community gardens, their progress is based on numbers. It's like, we're gonna build this many beds, we're gonna get this much stuff, we're gonna grow this much food, we're gonna send this much food to food banks. So it's, it's based on um, product. And education is based on process. So if I'm doing a workshop, if we get all the beds built by the end of the time, that's a wonderful thing. But more importantly, everybody's going to use the power tools. The kids are going to get to do the measuring. The, everything is going to happen. Everybody's going to touch everything and everybody's going to learn. Where um, I then become a frustration to the people who are trying to get the work done. So it's like, so it's been an interesting process and I think we're in a good place. Yeah, um, I don't want to take too much of your time because we have uh, not very much left. I do want to uh, get more of an interview about some of these topics because there is still so much that I, I think would be really great to record your opinions and recollections on. Um, I guess I just want to close by asking what projects um, do you have that you know currently um, with regard to garden education that you're working on, that you like, if any, that you like to talk about. What are you? Um, what are your future plans? Um, um, I garden tenders, mm -hmm. which has been around for since 1995, um, is the is a program for people who are interested in starting community gardens. So it's a it's a community organizing um, class. It has changed drastically because of COVID. Um, it used to be um, an eight week, three hour a night um, class where we did physically a lot of stuff and we combined gardening and organizing and, um, and projects and plans and um, people did reports and people took turns teaching. And it was like a really in-depth um, support group um, mm -hmm. And now we are a five week, hour and a half Zoom class. So it has become way different. Um, it's still worthwhile. And um, we are still walking people through the process of how to legally and uh, how to legally start a garden. What do you need to know? What you, uh, deal with the real estate, deal with, the, um, with your group, do a design, you know, all of that stuff. But it's more, um, a teaching rather than a building um, building the group and then building gardens we don't aren't doing that mm -hmm. so um, so that and I want to see we've been doing green city teachers and that made the same changes and uh, I want to see regular regular funding um, and regular staffing for our work with youth because it's seriously lacking here and um, mm -hmm. we need to do better. Yeah, that's been a, I mean, that hasn't been a, not necessarily related to the Horticultural Society, but I've encountered that with some other interviews. I'm with uh, Sylvia Metzler from Norris. We were talking about the importance of youth education mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how they Yeah, I mean, if we're not teaching the kids how to do this, <laughs> then what's, what's our legacy? Mm -hmm. Well, on that note, uh, thank you so much. Sally, I learned a lot. I'd like to keep learning more. Um, you just keep giving me coffee. I can yeah. forever. <laughs> oh, I didn't have any. I didn't give you any coffee today, so that's all on you. No. But, I, oh, actually, it's tea. I yeah. Tea. I was like, why, why is there a tea bag in your coffee? <laughs> uh, oh, it's your coffee bag. No, it's tea. Um, it's but tea. yeah, so I'm going to let you go now um, and turn off the recording.